look, maybe it would be better for them to socially distance and isolate themselves, and maybe they'll live another 10 years, and if they got the coronavirus at uh, Thanksgiving, that they would die. Okay, I understand that, and if that happens, that's a tragedy. But it should be up to them if they're willing to decide to take that risk or not. I don't have the right to take that freedom from them, and neither does Andrew Cuomo. Neither does Chris Cuomo. Neither does Anthony Fauci. Nobody should be allowed to make that decision except the person that is putting themselves at risk. Period. End of discussion. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. <laughs>So speaking of Andrew Cuomo, I just couldn't let this quote go. This one was too funny. I lost it. I absolutely lost it when I saw this. This is not from a news outlet. This is directly from a quote from him from the governor's office. And this is him talking about the coronavirus. We'll just look at this little highlighted part. <coughs> the president talks about CVS and Walgreens and national chains. Sure, but they are mainly located in rich communities and not poor communities. Let that sink in. My friends, we can't compound the racial injustice that COVID already created. Let me be clear, black and brown communities that were first on the list of who died cannot be last on the list of who receives the vaccine, period. So according to Andrew Cuomo, the fact that President Trump is going to be distributing the vaccine, at least according to his plan, through CVS, Walgreens, and other national pharmaceutical chains, is racist because black communities, especially poor black communities, they don't have those. Those are, to use his own words, primarily in rich communities. This is, you don't even have to do a fact check. This is automatically stupid to any person that doesn't live like Andrew Cuomo apart from everybody else. There are freaking CVSs and Walgreens everywhere. They're the two largest pharmaceutical chains in America. To illustrate my point, remember, I live in Montgomery. It is a city that is 70% black. I am the minority in this city. And by the way, it's one of the poorest capitals of any capital in the United States. I think it's like 30-ish, uh, it's in the 30s when it comes to the poorest cities in America. Yeah, Montgomery still has, uh, it's ranked eight, 48th in economic well-being of state capitals by Wallet Hub. So that means there's only two state capitals under us when it comes to economic well-being. We're one of the poorest cities in the country and 70% black. You know what? Still have six Walgreens and 11 CVSs. By the way, that is excluding Prattville, Wetumpka, Millbrook. That's just Montgomery proper. Six Walgreens, 11 CVSs. But there are no n none of those in poor black communities. What about Birmingham? Also 70% black, and by the way, even poorer than Montgomery. The World Population Review ranked it the ninth poorest city in America. You know how many Walgreens they got? 16. And how many CVSs? 17. And that's in the Birmingham metro. So that does include some of the outlying areas, but you know, it's hard to distinguish between those in Birmingham. So obviously in black, poor communities, there's still Walgreens and CVSs. What about Selma? That is the poorest city in the state of Alabama per capita. Yet Selma still has a Walgreens and a CVS. And it's a little bitty town. So the idea that there are not CVSs and not Walgreens in these poor communities are just dumb. This guy lives so high in his ivory tower. He doesn't even realize how stupid what he is saying is. And what's really horrible about this is he thinks that it is 
it, it reminds me of this guy in a video game I'm playing right now, Fire Emblem Three Houses, and it's a, in a medieval setting, and so there's like lords and nobles, and then there's commoners. There's one guy that's a noble, and this kind of plays into what we were talking about earlier with, with Andrew Cuomo. And he believes that it's his duty as a noble to protect and assist the commoners. It's very demeaning. It's very, uh, it, it's very much in the way of somebody that you would see as someone that just thinks that they're better than everyone else. He, he thinks that he's one of the good guys, because he is one of the nobles that looks as, as his duty as a noble, as an enlightened person, to help out the commoners and the poor folk because they're just beneath him and they can't really do anything on their own. And so it's, it's very degrading the way he treats them. But he thinks of himself as being the hero that is nobly going to those poor people that just aren't as smart and not as capable as him. And he's going to help them out. That's who Andrew Cuomo is. He reminds me so much of this guy. And it's because he really does look at other people. See, he sees himself as being the, the noble that is going and helping the commoners, the poor folks, the black people that can't, you know, they can't even get to a pharmacy to get a vaccine on their own. That's how dumb and incompetent they are. And because they can't go to a pharmacy that may not be in a, a rich neighborhood, and again, I have no idea why he thinks that CVSs and Walgreens are exclusive to rich neighborhoods, that he thinks because they can't even go to a pharmacy to get that vaccine, that he, as the, the noble, is going to swoop down and save them because they're too stupid to do anything for themselves. That's how Andrew Cuomo views poor black people. It's a really horrible way to look at the world. I, I don't see how these people aren't considered racist themselves. I mean, he never gets labeled a racist that I'm aware of, and yet, that's an incredibly demeaning thing to assume about somebody. Some of the worst racists you will ever run against are people that have a D behind their name. And it's unfortunate, but it is the truth. And remember, that kind of tracks, because that's what the Democrat Party was for the entirety of its lifespan up until really about 40, 50 years ago. But anyway, what's worse about all this is that what he's talking about here, because he's planning on, because of this, this was his announcement in suing the Trump administration, is that this is going to create another hurdle in his state to getting the vaccine, because all it's going to do is it's going to cause a legal hiccup, and it's going to make it harder and take longer for the vaccine to be distributed in Andrew Cuomo's state. And so it's really sad here is, because he has a bad case of Trump derangement syndrome and just assumes that if he's rolling out the vaccine through CVS and Walgreens, that must secretly be Trump's way trying to stick it to black people. That must be what Trump's really doing here. Again, I have no idea why this fantasy exists inside Andrew Cuomo's head, but apparently that is what he thinks about President Trump, that he's such an evil, heartless racist, that he is specifically behind the scenes trying to manipulate the distribution to make sure that poor black people aren't getting it. And because of this, he's going to sue which will probably cause people to not be able to get it as quickly, primarily in the poor and black communities in the state of New York, because it's going to take longer for them to be distributed there. Trump derangement syndrome. It's really terrible when it's just a talking head on TV saying something that makes absolutely no sense or throwing out conspiracy theories that have no basis in truth, it's a thousand times worse when it actually winds up hurting somebody that because somebody assumes that Trump is some kind of evil racist monster, that he does something that actually results in the very people he's claiming to be championing and protecting, it results in them not getting the things that they need, in this case, the distribution of the vaccine. It really is terrible that this is a case that could cost lives. And I mean, I'm honestly wondering if at this point Cuomo's just trying to up his body count, just doing everything he can to kill as many people from the coronavirus as humanly possible. It's very rare that I engage in the kind of hyperbolic language that people do. It's like, well, this politician has blood on their hands. I don't do that. Nine times out of ten... And if I do it, I'm very cautious about it. Cuomo is one of the few people that actually does. You know, as, as much as I may have disliked 
other politicians. I can't think of a scenario where they, they you know, have blood on their hands, a policy they did directly led to somebody's death. Andrew Cuomo really did. He's the one that came up with the nursing home policy that you cannot keep a person out, even if they know for a fact they're COVID positive, and then tried to hide it by counting the New York death records differently that if they were not within the four walls of a nursing home, even if they got the virus in the nursing home, they were sick for two weeks in the nursing home with the virus, you take them out of the nursing home and they die in a hospital five minutes before they're, they're passing, that that doesn't get counted as a nursing home death, and then went out and touted it at how low their nursing home numbers were. That's the kind of evil person that Andrew Cuomo is. And it, he's the moral compass that we're all supposed to listen to about how to handle the virus. I'm just not going to take it. I'm not. And perhaps the only person as dumb as Andrew Cuomo and as two-faced and manipulative and evil as Andrew Cuomo is his brother, Chris Cuomo. This is a unrelated but still important part of this. So what happens is Dr. Scott Atlas a few days ago, he's one of the president's advisors on the coronavirus, was talking about the impact of the virus and the impact also the health impact of the shutdowns and some of the things that they cause uh, an increase in things like suicide rate, an increase in things like depression, especially amongst uh, adolescents and that kind of thing. And, and then he starts talking about the elderly and how there is a level of isolation that is causing psychological damage to them. And this is something that's been reported both by conservative and mainstream news sources. But apparently there was just way too much for Chris Cuomo to handle, and he just absolutely melts down and goes off on the guy. Take a watch. Dr. Atlas, okay, a guy with no pandemic experience. He literally would know more if he stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. He's saying, hey, you in Michigan, these uh, measures to help try to control the spread, fight back. Are you kidding me? Shame on you. What kind of doctor would tell people to rise up and resist the only kind of prophylaxis that can help them? What the hell is the matter with this person? Rise up. You rise up and do your job or get the hell out. How could you give this kind of advice? Of course, Fauci was being measured. He says, I don't agree with his position. This isn't Fauci's fight. The science is obvious. This is about Trump and the Trumpers. He's going to have his main health guy stand up and say, fight back against the regulations to keep you safe. Listen to him. I'm not making it up. And this kind of isolation is one of the unspoken tragedies of the elderly who are now being told, don't see your family at Thanksgiving. For many people, this is their final Thanksgiving, believe it or not. What are we doing here? What the hell are you doing here? Yeah, it could be their last Thanksgiving. If you expose them to people who aren't wearing masks, who aren't socially distancing and haven't been doing so and haven't gotten tested because they somehow think they don't want to get in on the con of COVID. So that, of course, is CNN's Chris Cuomo, the brother of Governor Andrew Cuomo, saying all of this. First of all, it's an absurd argument from authority saying, well, this guy has absolutely no experience in pandemics. Yet, do you know what Dr. Atlas actually specializes in? Because he is a doctor, he's a neurologist. So, he, you know, his, his area of expertise is in neuroscience. But what he's actually known for and what made him famous, because he, he does work and is a, a staffer at Stanford, uh, the thing that actually made him famous is he studies how medical policies, government medical policies, affect the population. So this is his area of expertise, the unintended consequences of government making medical policy. That is his lane. And so... But even if that weren't, weren't true, even if Dr. Atlas was just a doctor, he acts as though having a medical degree is absolutely no qualification for speaking about a pandemic. Well, it is some qualification. It does play some role in this. I mean, let's say that there is a, a mechanic that is a, a specialized Dodge mechanic. Like he works at a Dodge dealership and he only works on Dodges. Okay, would you rather have him or some random dude on the street 
work on your Toyota. I mean, maybe the Dodge guy doesn't know everything about the Toyota, but I do trust him to know more than the random dude that's never worked on a car before in his life. I mean, that is some qualification. But the second part of that is, whenever someone makes an argument of authority, that's a pretty good indication they don't have much of an argument. And in his case, it's a negative argument, not a positive argument. And what I mean by that is he's saying this person is not qualified. Not that he is qualified, that he's not qualified, and he's making that argument of authority. That is a weak sauce argument. Because you'll notice at no point does he ever actually try to counter anything Atlas says or, or even says why he disagrees with it. He just says, well, the science is settled. I'm going to leave it there. So he's not going to back up his claim with evidence. He's not going to give a reason why the science is settled or what exactly he disagreed with with Dr. Atlas there. He just says, ah, well, you know, he's, he's not an expert and uh, I'm very mad about this. And that's basically all Chris Cuomo has to counter Dr. Atlas. Now, I'm not one of these guys that thinks just because somebody has a medical degree that he's God and I have to listen to everything he says and he's infallible. That was the stance of pretty much everybody on the left until the second that they saw somebody that didn't agree with them. And then all of a sudden, oh, that you can't trust that person. Listen to the experts. Well, except for this one expert that disagrees with me. Don't listen to him. That, he's a crazy person. He doesn't have any qualifications. And these are the same people that were pushing Dr. Fauci. And I don't hate Dr. Fauci. I don't think he's a horrible person. I think that he's wrong on a lot of things. But when it came to Dr. Fauci... I thought that he was an expert in pandemics, but they were asking him for advice on how to handle the economy and how to do all these other things. And so because he has a degree in medicine that he ought to be the, the end all be all and the constitution should be thrown away. And when we're in a pandemic, Dr. Fauci should just be the, the all powerful person at the top making all the decisions. And that's not anything close to resembling what should have happened here. But the second that they find an expert that disagrees with what they think, oh, well, then it's okay to not believe the experts. Listen to the, what they really meant was, listen to the experts that confirm what I already believe and disregard all the other experts. That's what they were really trying to say when they said, listen to the experts. They were saying, listen to my excerpts, uh, experts. And that's really the problem that Chris Cuomo has. He doesn't actually have anything to counter the argument. He just makes a really, really shallow argument of authority, and that's all he's got. The problem with Dr. Fauci from the onset, though, is that Dr. Fauci was always looking at one side of the ledger. And again, I don't think that Fauci is some kind of deep state stooge that, you know, despises Trump. I think that recently he's shown that he has quite a bit more animosity from Trump than we originally thought that he did, and that's not something to be overlooked. But my point in all of this is that Dr. Fauci was always looking at one side of the ledger, which is how do we keep cases down? Not a terrible way to approach the problem on the onset. But Dr. Fauci was never considering some of the other, and I'm not even talking about economic woes or, or how it affected the country or national security or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not asking Dr. Fauci to do that. That's not his job. I'm saying he wasn't even looking at the health ramifications on the other side. Because the health ramifications on the other side increases in things like depression undiagnosed medical conditions. Uh, people like me that were 28 and would have no reason to believe that they had cancer and only happened to have that discovered because I went into the hospital, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it had happened in the pandemic because they would have been closed. Or I might have been hesitant to go in because, I mean, the medical, the, the emergency room would have technically been open. But all of those other things we're not counting the cost of the shutdown. That's the problem. It's like the second that this happened, Dr. Fauci got tunnel vision and the only health to America, uh, the only threat to America's health is the coronavirus. Every other threat to health, obesity, uh, inactivity, depression, isolation, those all just went out the door the second the coronavirus went. They all were eliminated immediately. That's been the problem with Dr. Fauci is he's not considering the other side of this. Dr. Atlas is. He's taking a more comprehensive view of what the virus is doing and what the shutdowns are doing and the effect of the shutdown. With locking down everybody and cementing them inside their house and telling them they wouldn't leave stop the spread of the virus, yeah, it absolutely would. If you had 
policemen standing out someone's door and not letting them leave, that would cut down on the spread of the virus. But Fauci never considered the other side of that. And I know I straw manned a little bit there. I, I understand that. I understand that that's not what Dr. Fauci was proposing. I'm saying that continuing these lockdowns does have a side effect on America's health, the health and Dr. Fauci was never really considering that. Look, ultimately what this comes down to is something that I talked about earlier when we were discussing Kyle Whitmire's piece earlier in the show. I want other people to make that decision, not me. Same thing goes here with the Thanksgiving. When it comes to their mandates or when it comes to what a governor could say, I don't want to make that decision. I want them to make that decision. What Dr. Atlas was talking about there where he said, there might be some people that this is their last go-round, that this is their last Thanksgiving. Are you really going to sit there and tell somebody that is elderly, let's say that they've got terminal cancer, their doctor's only given them six months to live anyway, so virus or no, this is the last Thanksgiving for them. And we're telling them that they shouldn't be allowed to go have Thanksgiving dinner with their grandkids? No. That is not a thing that you can convince me it's okay for the government to tell them they're not allowed to do. You know, maybe that person does get coronavirus and they die four months earlier than they were expected to. That's a horrible tragedy. But maybe in their mind, it was worth seeing their grandkids on Thanksgiving to take that risk. I don't want to make that decision. I don't want to make it for everybody else. I don't want to tell them they can or that they can't that they should or that they shouldn't. I want them to make that decision. That's what liberty looks like. I may disagree with their decision. I might think their decision is dumb. But it's their decision to make. It's their life. And the idea that these bureaucrats sitting up in Washington or in Cuomo's case, Albany or wherever it is, Sacramento, California, that they can sit in their ivory towers up on high and they can dictate down to everybody else how they need to spend their holidays and the decisions that are too dangerous for them to make. That's what gets under my skin about this whole thing. The arrogance that you can make those decisions for thousands or millions of people, that you know better than them what's best for their life. Look, maybe it would be better for them to socially distance and isolate themselves, and maybe they'll live another 10 years, and if they got the coronavirus at uh, Thanksgiving, that they would die. Okay, I understand that, and if that happens, that's a tragedy. But it should be up to them if they're willing to decide to take that risk or not. I don't have the right to take that freedom from them, and neither does Andrew Cuomo. Neither does Chris Cuomo. Neither does Anthony Fauci. Nobody should be allowed to make that decision except the person that is putting themselves at risk, period, end of discussion. You're talking about somebody that may have... You know, to be honest, it may be my granddad's last Thanksgiving. He's in his 90s. It may be the last time I see him for Christmas. I don't know. But... The idea that you're going to tell somebody that fought for their country, who literally fought the Nazis, that they're not allowed to exercise the freedom that they put their lives on the line for already, risking their lives in Europe, you're going to tell me that that person doesn't have the right to decide for themselves whether or not they get to see their grandkids on the holidays. No, I don't accept that. And I question the morality of anybody that does. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman. So now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel Otherwise, you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.